He is a part of one of the most amazing three-part harmony trios to come out of London, England during the 1970s. Lead singer, songwriter, guitarist, percussionist, Mr. Dewey Bennell. Dewey, how are we going yeah. today? Hi, JJ. I'm doing great. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, I find it really interesting, Dewey, that along with you and Jerry and Dan, you guys were all sons of U.S. servicemen that were stationed in London, England, and you were the only one out of the three that were born in London, England. And how did you guys all come together? We came together because of um, our fathers were in the Air Force, and uh, they were all stationed at a U.S. base there in London. And the three of us, the original trio, met in, uh, in high school out there. So it was pretty much dependence of military families and that's how we ended up there and there's an interesting story uh dewey behind the uh, the band name america i know you guys were uh, were playing there in england and, and 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 is it is it true the story goes that you guys just didn't want to be you know known as uh people for you know englishmen you want to be known as america well yes and no i mean we were certainly americans and certainly had our own little expatriate community there the kids were from all different states and some of them had lived in other countries, too, so we had our own little close-knit community of Americans. But we spent a lot of time out in the British world, if you will, off the base and uh, in London and so on. But, yeah, we just became known. You know, we identified ourselves as Americans. And everybody was a little bit homesick at, in one way or another. So it just stood to reason when we started the trio that um, that was the one distinguishing, you know, fact that we were these americans and the band chicago had recently come out 68 and there we were we graduated from high school in 69 and we were avid music lovers and picking apart every record we ever we could get our hands on so um you know america just seemed like a, a go-to name and of course it has an impact it's kind of who would be crazy enough to pick a name like that so it did its job to uh, get your attention and then after that hopefully the music speaks for itself and producer uh, Ian Samwell and uh, manager Jeff Dexter uh, were kind of instrumental in uh, getting you guys signed to the UK Warner Brothers label. Is that correct? That is correct. We were very fortunate. You know, everything lined up for us. Like, as they say, timing is everything. And we did have this handful of songs that we'd each written, and that's what we were walking around London trying to get somebody to listen to. We did have some contacts at a studio, so we met an engineer and that met a producer, and then we found this guy, Jeff Dexter, who was a plugged-in guy with a lot of the big shows. He was a, an MC, kind of a DJ type, if you will, in those days, and, and uh, multi-act shows were going on with big names, and he squeezed us in. We'd do 20 minutes in front of The Who or Elton John or Pink Floyd, and so the audience grew instantly, and we got a lot of... of uh, heavyweight BBC and, and uh, the record labels interested right out of the shoot, and so we were super lucky that way. And the, uh, the, the band's uh, self-titled debut album was actually re-released with the release of a particular song uh, that was originally titled Desert Song, and then it was quickly <laughs> changed to A Horse With No Name. Why, uh, why was the song title changed, and what's the story behind uh, A Horse With No Name? Well, we, uh, once the, that first handful of songs I was talking about earlier was, was what got us the record deal. We got a three-year, three-album deal with Warner Brothers London, so we went in and recorded all those songs fairly rapidly. And we had uh, "I Need You" as the as the go-to single from it. And as, as as the project continued moving on, the label said, "Well, hey, have you got any more songs?" We were writing more. So we went in and recorded four other songs, of which "Desert Song," as you pointed out, was one of them. And it turned out there was a, a there's a, a famous opera called "Desert Song." So uh, and our our then producer. Ian Samwell, who you mentioned earlier, said, "Oh, you must you must call it Horse with No Name. <laughs> that's the that's the hook line in the chorus." And I said, "Fine, I wrote that one." So, uh, so that's what the way that happened. And and by then the uh, album had been released without Horse with No Name. So we had this album out and this separate single out. And of course, by the time the second pressing of the first album uh, was done, they had included Horse with No Name. So there are a handful of so-called collector's items, the first vinyl uh, copies of the first album without Horse with No Name out there. Which would be amazing to get because I actually collect records uh, myself and uh, just love the, uh, the the sound and the and the um, you know the uh, the surround sound of actual vinyl instead of you know CDs that we're all so accustomed to. And and yeah. now did did Jerry Buckley that was he basically was he the guy who came up with the arrangement for um, I Need You? Well, Jerry's always been pretty much the musical director, if you will. He was schooled in that, and he uh, when we get into arranging vocal harmonies, although a lot of that now comes second nature, but in the beginning. He was very good at directing that, and uh, I, I give him all kudos for, for taking the bull by the horns in that regard. He, Yeah, I mean, arrangements are, 
are an interesting thing. I mean, you write a song, but then it's what you do with it afterwards, and it can be a multitude of, of little tweaks and things. The melody and the choruses and the chord changes are all in place, but then there's a ton of little things you can do. And as far as I need you, Jerry had written it on the piano. It was originally a piano song. We play it now with acoustic guitars primarily, although we do have our bass player doing a little... It, no, that's not on that song either. Yes, it is. He plays a little piano intro on it. I'm thinking ahead here. But Jerry, yeah, Jerry usually has uh, his songs fully arranged in his head, so there's not a lot we, in the process, there's not a whole lot that I add much over the years, a lyric maybe now and then, but uh, that's, a, you know, it's been a very, um, you know, we work hand in hand virtually on all these things. Before the sophomore album uh, hit the uh, hit the stores, the, the guys actually re- relocated here to uh, Los Angeles, and what was that experience like for you personally, Dewey, uh, working in the studio with uh, legendary drummer Hal Blaine on the band's album, Homecoming? Well, it was, at that point, this thing had exploded. The first album had done so well. The first single, first album, went to number one in England. The American parent company in L.A. uh, insisted we come and do a six-week club tour, and then they would release it in the U.S. By the time we hit New York uh, and started that six-week club tour, and by the time we got out to the whiskey in L.A., it was number one, and it was just a crazy whirlwind time. Uh, David Geffen called, said, we want to manage you guys and uh and of course we did we were american boys and uh jeff dexter at that point had uh kind of he he just he was doing his other thing and we all said okay bon voyage we all moved back to the states to la and got apartments and the whole thing just blossomed and david geffen and elliot roberts took over management and we started like you said on the second album right away at the record plant in la and uh we did see we were a trio acoustic uh, guitars and bass that Jerry and Dan would uh, share the bass part. We had no rhythm section, and we were just sitting on stools, you know, a la Crosby, Stills and Nash, or Peter, Paul, and Mary, you name it. We had just, that club tour, we opened for the Everly Brothers, which were, were influences of ours and so many others, and they were their two acoustic guitars up there, and, and we went on to uh, fill out the, uh, the show with a, with a rhythm section. I mean, fill out the recordings on the second album with a rhythm section, but we then had to had to transfer that to the live show. And I should say that Hal Blaine, you mentioned Hal Blaine, I, I didn't mean to gloss that over at all. Uh, it was only in retrospect that I, we, we got to know Hal. I, didn't, I knew little or nothing about he and the Wrecking Crew's history and those players. We also had Joe Osborne. And, and for your listeners who aren't aware, the Wrecking Crew was the dub name of a handful of session players in, in Los Angeles who virtually created the pop hits of the 60s and 70s in, in so many ways. They played on virtually Google them, listeners. You won't believe how many records those guys played on. And Hal Blaine, it was just an absolute uh, joy to work with and uh, such a talented guy, and he's still, still at it, of course. So that was a, a wonderful connection. We really plugged into the L.A. world with that. Right. And Dewey, not just because I'm doing the interview with you today, but my absolute favorite America song is Ventura Highway. And I heard a story that you were inspired when you were in seventh grade. I think you might have been with your parents, and you guys had a flat tire or something, and you saw a sign on a highway or something well, like you that? you have done your homework. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the, we were stationed at Vandenberg Air Force Base up by Lompoc, Santa Maria, uh, in 62 and 3. Mm-hmm. And, um, in fact, I was the only guy of the band who had actually lived in California up, up until that point. We, all see, we obviously all moved out back out to California. I had lived in, we were stationed there at Vandenberg and then up in San Jose and in the Bay Area uh, also a bit later. But yeah, um, I vividly remember when we moved back to England or moved to England when, the, when this writing of music began and I was seeking out inspiration. My mind always drifted back to a lot of the, the things that had happened in the U.S., and Horse With No Name was based a lot on the Southwest when we would visit my relatives in New Mexico and drive through Arizona and um, Southern California. And likewise, Ventura Highway was based primarily on that whole beach scene and sun and surf of, um, of that area. Yeah, we, we had broken down, and we were on the coast highway there, and I just remember looking up and seeing a freeway sign that just said Ventura Oxnard or Carpinteria or something up there. And there I am sitting in a little shack, basically, that the three of us were hippies living in in England on a rainy day and kind of dredged up those images of uh, the free wind blowing through my hair. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was a great inspiration to have to have lived in California in the early 60s. In fact, my nickname, Dewey, is, comes from the famous surfer Dewey Weber, 
and I adopted it. My real name is Lee. So uh, there was a whole lot of California influence, at least with me at that point, I think, once we were in England. And I love England, but it's certainly not uh, the same lifestyle, or it wasn't then, as, as what we'd left in California. And, and what's the story, Dewey, behind you, know, you, you guys getting in touch with uh, producer uh, George Martin for those albums? Well, uh, we, then we went on to make the third album. By the, by the way, at that point, from the second and third album, we were producing ourselves primarily. Mm-hmm. And it, it turned into a bigger job than, uh, than we thought, because there's a lot more to just saying, hey, that sounds good. I mean, there's all kinds of paperwork involved in booking studios, and if you are using other players, which we used some, you know, there's all kinds of stuff like that, accounting, whatever. And so we needed a producer after the third album. We spent the most time we ever spent on an album on that Patrick album because we just killed a lot of time in the studio and, and we're not very organized. It was 73, after all. Anyway, we, uh, so we put our heads together, and uh, George Martin was in town. David Geffen and Elliot um, were able to make contact with him. He was in town for uh, Live and Let Die and Paul McCartney, the uh, James Bond film. And so he said, sure, we'll take a meeting. And, of course, he was finished with the Beatles, or the Beatles were finished with the Beatles at that point. He was obviously working with Paul, but he had a lot of time on his hands, and he was available, and there was another timing thing. And we just hit it off immediately. We sat in that room at at Geffen's office, and uh, and just we just hit it off. I think the fact that we had been in England, understood the whole British sense of humor, food, you name it, we were comfortable with each other. He took off his shoes. We talked about it. He was aware of the first three albums, and um, the only the only requirement he said was, "Yeah, let's give it a sh- let's give it a go, boys." But you must come to England and use his studio, Air Studios, in Oxford uh, Circus there in London. We said sure. We hadn't been back for a while. And- and we went on to make seven albums with him, including the uh, greatest hits. And, you know, re- he remixed the greatest hits, the hits that we had done before him. And we had a great time together and had a lot of success, especially in those early albums. The song Tin Man, and I, I read somewhere where you were kind of influenced by The Wizard of Oz. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. That was always my favorite movie and probably still is, if not the top movie. It's right up there in my top three because, you know, as a child, it, it's not like it is today. We would you would see that movie on TV maybe once a year around Halloween or I mean around uh, Thanksgiving or or Easter or something. It was usually a holiday movie, and wow, it's going to be on TV, you know. And so the film itself always inspired me, and I, I did always like the the obvious themes that that all these personality traits are things that we have in us. This wish to be smarter or or braver or you know. The, the Tin Man was always felt unloved or wanted love, and he, he didn't have a heart, or he did have the heart. I've got it confused. But that was what it was um, It was loosely based on. That. And my grammar, of course, is terrible. I've been busted so many times for my grammar in some of my songs. <laughs> but uh, Oz never did give nothing to the Tin Man that he didn't already have, was the, was the central uh, focus of the song. Although the rest of it, there's some pretty abstract lyric writing in there, which I tend to do, poetic license. The the band's album, Hearts, was recorded up north in Sausalito, California, and the tune, Sister, Sister Golden Hair, now, was that kind of inspired by George Harrison's uh, My Sweet Lord? Well, Jerry wrote that one, and he, like I said earlier, he had in his mind already that line, that sly guitar line, and I'm sure it was. He's always said that George was his favorite Beatle and so on, and it certainly did, it had that My Sweet Lord feel to it. He played it, I think, on the original demo, and then I think Dan played it on the record. I have to go back and look. But Michael Woods does it every night on stage. He does a fine job, and that is that is one of the hooks of that song, obviously. Yeah, what a great, great song. You guys had so many great, great songs together. And uh, then towards the end of the 1970s, band member uh, Dan Peek walked away from the band, but yourself and uh, Jerry actually continued on as America and landed a great 80s tune called You Can Do Magic. And how did you discover the elements to that great song, Magic? Well, um, we were at a, at a kind of a, a crossroads in our career, having uh, Dan having left the band in 77, and we did change management. A couple of the uh, under-managers at Geffen Roberts had formed their own company, John Hartman and Harlan Goodman, and we went with them. Uh, the Geffen Roberts management thing was kind of dispersing at that point because Def- David had uh, started uh, Asylum Records, and Elliot was taking care of Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and CSN, and everybody went off. The Eagles went off with Irving Azoff, and we went off with, with John and Harlan and Hoko. It was all that was going on. 
So we found ourselves, it was the end of the 70s, into the 80s, like you said, there was a lot of musical changes going on. The new wave uh, music scene was up and running, and we really were having uh, not much not much radio success with the previous album. So we, we looked for some outside material. And a writer named Russ Ballard wrote You Can Do Magic for us, specifically for us. And it was really great. He was British, too. We went and recorded in England. And he had a, a great pedigree. He'd worked with, with uh, the Zombies and Rod Argent. And he, was, he had written a ton of songs, um, winning for Santana. And we just loved the song. We thought it fit us. And lo and behold, it, it did... Uh, sort of give us a leg up into the 80s. I mean, we're still predominantly known as a 70s band, obviously, but we have had some successes after that. And uh, it's it's 43 years later, and we're still touring and still loving it. So, Dewey, tell me what you guys are working on these days. Well, the last project was um, called Back Pages, which was last year, and it was we did it in Nashville, and it was a bunch of writers that we loved from from before. We still write a lot. It's just, it's a very interesting dynamic that to still have survived career-wise into the digital age and into the 21st century and, and through into streaming and downloads. and So the record industry itself has changed dramatically. And in a lot of ways, that affects at least my, my writing to the degree that you can work at home and there's not record labels anymore. So we're really in a place now that is, is, is really almost like back to grassroots, setting up YouTube channels and Facebook pages and you know working through the Internet. So um, to answer that question, we did. We are, are and a producer from years ago said, "Hey, come to Nashville. I got these players, and let's do a covers album." And we really wanted to do that. We, we'd never done a lot of outside material since we'd written most of our own over the years. And all artists, I think, with extended careers, will find themselves like we hit that point where we wanted to do a, ho- a Christmas album, a holiday album, which was a lot of fun, and we enjoyed doing that. This was another one of those projects that was doing outside material so we did Joni Mitchell song and a Bob Dylan song and a James Taylor song and uh, Mark Knopfler Jimmy Webb people that we really respect and uh, and love Paul Simon so that was called back pages that was the last project uh, and right now there's a possible back back pages two in the works we ha- we have been pulling out some of the songs we've been writing in the last year or so But basically, we tour quite a bit. And Dewey, I'm sure you guys love going out on the road and uh, seeing all your fans. Dewey Bunnell of America, thank you so very much. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, letting me relive my youth there on that interview, (laughs) J.J. It's been great.